I'd like to welcome everyone to our uh, Bible study that we have here a couple of times a week at Slater United Methodist Church. My name is uh, David Mosser and I'm the pastor here. Sometimes people ask me what gives me the uh, confidence or the right uh, to do these Bible studies. First of all, uh, one of the things that pastors should do if they're not doing it is to try to teach scripture, which means uh, one studies scripture before one teaches it. Uh, second thing is I just have um, a very deep and abiding interest in the scripture lessons that we have because I think it informs our faith and it helps us understand not only God a little better, although God is completely inscrutable to us, but if we get a toehold in the identity of who God is for us, then we get uh, a great glimpse into who we are as human beings. Uh, I've uh, gone to school a lot, studied a lot. I'm very curious about these things and I enjoy doing that. Uh, today, our lesson is on the 35 verses of Psalm 104. And uh, if you look at Psalm 104 very carefully, you will notice that it has a, a great deal of literary kinship to Psalm 103. Both of them use that phrase, bless the Lord, O my soul, which is the way the New Revised Standard Version puts it. Uh, the uh, New International Version is very close to that. Uh, and uh, what we will be using as a text today will be the uh, Common English Bible, which is one that is uh, favored by uh, many in the Methodist Church for reasons that I do not want to uh, entertain right now. Uh, so we go to these, uh, these verses, these 35 verses in uh, Psalm 104, which makes it one of the longer Psalms that we have. Of course, the longest psalm is uh, Psalm 119, which is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 176 verses, which makes it a very, very long psalm. <coughs> I guess I'm allergic to long psalms, but anyway, uh, this psalm begins by saying, let my whole being bless the Lord. And uh, what this psalm does is it gives us sort of a faith-based look at our world. What does the world of creation look like when understood through the faith of people like you and me uh, in a God that has created it in uh, six days and rested on the seventh? There are many scholars that make a big deal about uh, the idea that this psalm should be paired with Genesis 1 uh, because of the kind of language it uses and also because of the content of the psalm, which is in some respects very similar to the content of Genesis 1 where God said, let there be light and there was light, let there be uh, separation of the waters from the dry land and there was and, and so forth. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, the creator that provides the uh, staging area. We could call that is what the world is for human beings. It's staging area because that's where they live out their lives. And uh, this, uh, this Psalm uh, 104 deals a lot with the splendor of creation, uh, probably more than it talks about the praise of the Creator. Now, there's praise of the Creator, no doubt, but it mostly talks about how wonderful this world is that God has created to give to uh, human beings. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Uh, this psalm celebrates basically three primary things. First of all, it's the order of creation. The creation is very orderly if one steps back and can see the whole thing. 
The second thing is that there's a certain symmetry to creation. Day, night, uh, dry land, water, and male, female, and so forth. Um, and so that's important as well. And uh, then there's also just the pure majesty of creation. Um, earlier this morning, I was listening to uh, some music. I believe it was by Eric Satie, which I'm not a music expert, but the music was familiar and it was very beautiful. And along with it, they were playing a slideshow. And the first five to six minutes of the music by Satie was a slideshow about places where people could sit. Uh, park benches, uh, there was a bench built into the, uh, this massive uh, stone wall that looked like it could be in Lisbon, Portugal or someplace like that. It just came right out of the wall. Uh, there were seats, uh, uh, log, uh, seats, uh, there were picnic tables and so forth. And in almost every one of these pictures was this uh, beautiful, magnificent uh, image of the world that God has created and has given to human beings like you and me to not only inhabit and to live in, but also to work in and to be participants in. And uh, so uh, the one thing that, that commentators often say about this psalm is that it is a psalm that praises the environment and talks about how people like us should care for the environment, take care of the environment, because it has been given to us a gift, as a gift from God. And uh, if one thinks about this carefully and understands the, the point of view that I'm going to bring now, it makes us stewards of the natural order. We're given the household of the whole environment uh, to manage, and by doing so, we become stewards of the natural world. Um, when we uh, get down into uh, some of these verses, uh, verses one through nine in uh, Psalm 104, basically talk about the sovereignty of the Lord's rule. Uh, it talks about God's kingship. Uh, it, in verse two, it says, you wear light like a robe. That's a very powerful image. You open the skies like a curtain. You build your lofty house on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. This is very divine uh, praise type language. Uh, you uh, go, uh, your chariot going around uh, on the wings of the wind. Uh, you make the winds your messengers. You make fire and flame your ministers. And so what this is basically doing is saying that God as a creator uses all these natural elements, fire and flame, wind, um, uh, clouds, they all serve God's purposes. And uh, that, that's very powerful language here in the psalm. Uh, and then it talks about just the creation. Uh, you establish the earth on its foundations so that it will never fall. Not only does God create the world, but he creates it in a way in which it is steadfast and can be relied upon by human beings from today throughout all of our lives. And it talks about that that God covered it with water and um, that uh, uh, they overflowed the mountains and uh, uh, the places that God has established for them. Uh, God sets boundaries so the waters may no longer uh, again cover the earth. And so what we see here is the idea that God is uh, in control of God's creation and that the creation is pretty magnificent and people should stop, sit on those benches that I had mentioned before and just take in the greatness and the grandness uh, of God's very creation. Uh, 
Sometimes theologians have tried to talk about this, about how we can read the face of God on the face of nature. And uh, sometimes this is called natural theology as opposed to historical theology or revealed theology. Uh, then when we get down to uh, uh, verse 10, it said, you put gushing waters into dry riverbeds. They flow between the mountains, providing water for every wild animal. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Overhead, the birds in the sky make their home, chirping loudly in the trees. From your lofty house, you water the mountains. Your earth is filled uh, by the fruit of what you have done. You provide grass for the cattle, so on and so forth. This section of the psalm, uh, essentially uh, verses 10 through 18, talks about the uh, providential nature of God. That God provides uh, for not only human beings, but for the mountains, the riverbeds, uh, for the animals, uh, for for cattle, uh, for the birds chirping in the trees. Uh, he, God provides wine and oil and bread. And in that sense, uh, you can almost say that there was a communion element to uh, this particular part of the psalm. That is in verse uh, 15. And wine, which cheers people's hearts along with oil, which makes the face shine and bread which sustains the human heart. And so all those things are part of the elements of communion that we even today participate in. Uh, the Lord's trees are well watered. The cedars of Lebanon, which are quite famous in Hebrew scriptures, which God planted, where the birds make their nests, where the stork has a home in the cypresses, the high mountains belong to the mountain goats. The ridges are a refuge of the badgers. And so we see this uh, continuing sort of list of animals uh, added to uh, cattle and birds and so forth. We now have goats and even badgers. When we get then to verse 19, it uh, reminds us that God made the moon for the seasons uh, and also the sun. In the ancient world, many people worshiped the sun. Uh, the Egyptians did, Ray Atom especially. Uh, some people uh, uh, worshiped the moon or the stars. And uh, what the psalmist is trying to remind us here is as great as the sun, the moon, and the stars are, we must never forget that it was God that created those particular entities. They didn't just show up to be worshiped by human beings, but they were actually, in fact, in the order of creation. If you look at it in uh, chapter one of Genesis, they were created by God's hand and, uh, so he, he talks about all of this. And when we get down to the bottom, down here at verses 22 and 23, it says, when the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. He's talking about the young lions. And then in 23, it says, then people go off to their work to do their work until evening. And uh, what's important about this particular phrase, and I want to share that with you, is this idea that, uh, that human beings were created to till and keep the garden. We see that in uh, Genesis uh, 2. Uh, and what that means is that we are partners with God in creation. God has created everything given it to us to be stewards over, and, and then we till and keep the garden. Our work is sacred work because we help God take care of the creation that God has provided for us and all of uh, the natural order, which would be lions and tigers and bears uh, that in that particular 
case. And so when he talks about that, he talks about human beings um, are workers in God's creation. So in that way, we are like gardeners in God's garden, which we call the earth. Uh, then in verses uh, 24 and uh, 25, uh, it, it's a uh, praise language. Lord, you have done so many things. You have made them all so wisely. So not only does God deal with uh, uh, bulk, a lot of things, quantity, but he also does it uh, in a qualitative way when it says that God has created these things and done so wisely. And then we see, uh, and then there is the sea, wide and deep with its countless creatures, living things, both small and large. There go to the, uh, there go the ships on it, and Leviathan, which is like a great sea monster, uh, which you made, plays in it. Now, I want to make a comment about this. Generally speaking, when we see great bodies of water, the sea or the ocean, usually called the sea in Scripture, uh, what we see is chaos or something to be feared or... Um, evil. It's often, the sea is often personified as a place from which evil will come. Leviathan, same thing. Leviathan uh, is in the waters. It's something to be uh, afraid of, uh, much like, say, a crocodile, for instance. Uh, and, and so what's odd here is that this Psalm 104 takes an image that is generally nefarious or evil and it turns it and uh, the, it, it basically says that the sea and Leviathan, which are generally to be feared, uh, are those things that respond to God because God created them. Uh, usually they're evil, but here they are responsive to God. Uh, in fact, Leviathan plays in this evil water in other circumstances, or uh, sport is another way that that idea of play is uh, translated. Uh, when we get to verse 27 through 30, uh, I want you to, uh, to hear this and imagine it as a table prayer uh, before one uh, eats a meal with friends, neighbors, family, colleagues. Uh, all your creations wait for you to give them their food on time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they're filled, completely full. But when you hide your face, they're terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you let loose your breath, they are created, and then you make the surface of the ground brand new again. Um, what these verses remind us is that as beautiful and wonderful uh, as creation is, and as it, its, its beauty is manifested in so many different ways, nonetheless, Creation itself is always dependent on the creator. God himself is sovereign over everything that God has created, no matter how wonderful it is and no matter how much we join it. And uh, one, it's a it's daily gift, this creation, which is given to us to be stewards over. And one thing that I noticed uh, in verse 30, it says, when you let loose your breath, they are created. Uh, and, and that reminds me not only of, uh, of uh, Genesis 1 and 2 where God uh, breathes into the human beings the breath of life, the ruach, the pneuma uh, that animates human beings, uh, but it may also be an allusion to what happens at Pentecost where you have this community of faith after Jesus has been... Uh, essentially crucified, has died, 
was buried in, in the Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And then suddenly he's resurrected. And then 50 days later, he ascends to God. And uh, this idea of God's spirit animating this group of uh, people that are very afraid, that are behind closed doors uh, in the upper room, 120 of them say, and, and we see this story in, in Acts 2, is that God's spirit comes and quickens them and enlivens them and creates the church within this group of people that uh, turn out that to have uh, 3,000 people added to their numbers that very day because of the strength of the Spirit. Here, Psalm 104 anticipates that kind of power of the Spirit, and it's good for us to, uh, to remember that. And, and so the last verses, 31 through 35, uh, talk about the uh, spontaneous wonder, gratitude, and praise that people will offer uh, God Almighty because of this gift of creation that God has given to us and that the creation depends on God and God's power to sustain it and the sort of guarantee that God gives us that it will not be taken away from them in an instant but will last into uh, the time of the consummation of human history. Uh, the, the world is well-parented, in other words. God becomes the parent of our world, and Psalm 104 is a testament uh, to that fact. I would like to thank you very much for being with us today, and uh, I look forward to uh, next week, and I believe our text for next week uh, will be from Deuteronomy, and uh, I just... I don't remember the numbers right now, but uh, I'm sure that uh, it will be enlivening and enlightening, I hope. So thank you very much for being with us today.